Um, oh, welcome to this, the first ever uh, live Shark Tank. I'm here with uh, Mr. Whitehorn, eminent historian in the Reading Historical Association. Um, and for the first time, we have a live audience as we're here at the illustrious Reading School. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, the topic uh, this week is the English Civil War. Um, so, I think probably let's kind of begin. Yeah, and let's get started. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, right. Um, so, I think probably let's start with you know the person who's widely known to be the cause of the English Civil War, which is mm. Charles the First. So, yeah, probably just a bit of a character study is in mm. order. And I think the, the key to that would be in his father's work, which is actually addressed to him mm. um, as his unborn son, mm. um, which is uh, Basilica Decon. Yes. Which is published in 1599. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Bas Basilica and Doran, which is written by James I, as you say. Um, interestingly, not actually initially addressed to Charles I, actually addressed to Charles' older brother, Henry. Oh, yes, he, died he died, yes. What the, could have been? The great, the great sort of lost English king, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and the Basilica and Doran really sets out um, James's ideas for what it should be, to what it should mean to be a king. It's all a, it's a manual for good kingship, and it really sort of sets out this idea of absolute monarchy, which is obviously going to cause huge problems in Charles's reign. Yeah, so, um, so it's the idea of sort of a wise king, yes. kind of ruling fairly mm -hmm. over his subjects. But that's something that came into conflict with the prevailing yeah. kind of winds at the time, which yeah. was that of kind of increasing middle class. And I think uh, you can see this in um, kind of the increasing kind of vocalness of the House of Commons during this time. Yeah. So like, um, you know, and also the uh, developing, kind of moving away from a feudal system more mm. towards something that we'd recognize now. So for example, yeah. in the city of London, um, guilds are becoming irrelevant yeah. um, at this time. So yeah. uh, I think it shows that the, the power is moving away from the sort of feudal yeah. uh, sense of absolute monarchy towards a more democratic, you might say, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, decentralised power. Well, yeah, this is absolutely, it's by no means inevitable. Obviously, you see it in France and in Russia that absolutism continues, obviously, to its full extent with Louis XVI and the French Revolution in France, and then obviously with Nicholas II and the Russian Revolution in Russia. Like, there's no reason why it shouldn't have gone that way in England as yes. well. Uh, it's the peculiar sort of events of the time which mean you lead to this situation with the Civil War. So, yeah, sure. um, so probably one of the big um, drivers of the kind of increasing middle class would perhaps be the uh, dissolution of the monasteries, Absolutely. which kind of freed up a lot of land in um, mm. kind of in England, which would have once been kind of owned by the Catholic Church, but was actually given to a lot of kind of peasant farmers mm -hmm. to kind of you know farm yeah. for their own subsistence farming. Yeah. But but you know after that uh, it became kind of um, fields were enclosed yeah. into kind of larger, more productive yeah. um, kind of farms, which, you know, although yielded more, kind mm -hmm. of moved towards a commercial enterprise as farming. Yeah, absolutely. And it's all obviously a legacy of um, the Reformation and the changing religion. Yeah. And obviously religion is going to be a huge part yeah. of some of the causes um, of the English so I, I think possibly, yes. Um, so Charles I incurs the wrath of um, Parliament by marrying the Catholic Bourbon... Yes. Um, Henrietta Maria. Absolutely, marriages don't they? Yeah, and actually, <laughs> and actually in Basilica in Basilica Doron, um, uh, James the first actually instructs his son to mm. marry a wife of the same religion, yes. which <laughs> he fails to do. Yeah. So he needs to read his books. Absolutely, um, and yeah. also his kind of poor prosecution of the Thirty Years' War yeah. um, was another key factor. Yeah, absolutely. The Thirty Years' War, the war between Protestantism and Catholicism, to simplify fight in France. Um, you, it, interestingly, you have, um, this particularly happens right at the start of Charles's reign, um, you have the, he, it's quite popular for the English to get involved and support the Protestants uh, in the Thirty Years' War, um, but Charles does a terrible, terrible job of doing so, um, appointing his best mate, uh, the Duke of Buckingham, to go and lead the army. Mm. Buckingham is Incredibly unpopular. <laughs> it's an absolute debacle, and everything goes wrong. Doesn't, doesn't Buckingham get uh, assassinated via yes. a disgruntled army general? Yeah. And I think, interestingly, also he was, um, uh, despite being a royal favourite of Charles, he was also um, yeah. James the First's lover. Yes. Because you know that's not awkward at all, is no, it? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it all gets a 
little bit questionable there. I think I think we should maybe say allegedly. Okay, well, um, let, let's say alleged, and there. let's also not mention the fact that there was a passageway between Char yeah. James, the, James the First and the Duke of Buckingham's bedrooms. Yes. Um, uh, but uh, again, yeah. allegedly, you know, yeah. they could have been playing Scrabble. Um, <laughs> Um, so um, all of this sort of um, incurred animosity towards the king from mm -hmm. Parliament. Yeah. But the thing is, Parliament was pretty necessary at that time, mm -hmm. um, especially um, yeah. about you know taxation. And so he needed Charles. Charles needed funds to fund the war in um, in Europe. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, Parliament didn't want to give it to him. Mm -hmm. um, and so he. Um, enacted the Shippage and Tonnage Act. Yes, I, I think it'd be good for us to pause a second and just talk about what exactly Parliament's doing at this time. Um, Parliament's really, um, it's not what we're talking about with modern day Parliament, it's much more an advisory body. Um, Charles can call it whenever he wants and dissolve it whenever he wants, um, but its key role, its key thing that, it, that Charles needs it for is, as you said, taxation. And so if he ever wants to fight war, he needs Parliament to, uh, for that assessment. Obviously, as you're saying, he tries to work without it uh, with, as you're saying, the shift in the Yeah, yeah um, and that, and sort of the outrage from that leads to the Petition of Right in mm. 1628, yeah. which um, kind of advised strongly against um, extra parliamentary taxation and which yes. uh, Charles you know, grudgingly agrees to, essentially, yes. to avoid war yep. with his own people. Yep. Um, uh, but the thing is, obviously, that didn't really, you know, Charles didn't particularly like that, and no. so he just said, go away to Parliament, yeah. shut up and go away, uh, yeah. to paraphrase the uh, Defence Secretary, yeah. um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, began the Eleven Years' Tyranny. Yes, also known as the personal rule that yes. you were a bit more favourable towards Charles. Yeah, um, um, but, but the thing is, this was a time of excessively unpopular decisions, yep. um, so he um, appointed royal favourites, um, mm. as you say, yeah. Um, so, like, um, Strafford became Lord Lieutenant yeah, of Ireland, or Lord Deputy, actually. Yeah. Um, and, of course, our most illustrious uh, alums, um, yes. William Lord, yes. was appointed Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about Lords. Yeah. Um, so, he was a bit of a frustrated man, um, mm -hmm. to be quite honest. He was very short. And a frustrating man as well. He was very frustrating. <laughs> yes. Oh. Um, but the thing is, he was, um, he was appointed as Archbishop of Canterbury when he was mm. 60, so he was quite yes. old, very dogmatic at that time. Served as Bishop of London beforehand as well, so he'd already been an important figure throughout the, throughout the kingdom. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and um, he responded autocratically to any um, mm -hmm. kind of attempt to have um, opposing views to his yeah. kind of very high church Anglicanism yeah. and uh, famously at one point he cut off the um, ears or tongues of three dissenters actually yep. which caused mm -hmm. kind of outrage obviously yeah, absolutely. Um, but the kind of yeah I think just to sort of talk about what exactly Lord was sort of really against um, obviously we've got the Protestant church and within the Protestant church there's increasingly division um, between sort of what Lord's looking for, which is kind of like this high church, sort of almost Catholic element mm. to it, uh, and the more radical, what you might call the Puritan elements of the church. Uh, and previously, they kind of, and under the sort of reigns of Elizabeth and James, um, they've been seen as kind of like, we're all still part of the same Protestant church, mm. but under Lord's uh, and under Charles I, increasingly, they're seen as heretics, they're seen as people opposing the church to be cracked down upon violently, as opposed to sort of the brothers who need to be sort of taken back into the fold yes. as they've been seen before. Yes, and um, I think the um, main kind of result of this sort of autocratic approach was mm -hmm. the Bishop's War of... Um, yes, absolutely. 1638 to 41, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, so that was when um, uh, England attempted to bring... Uh, the Church of Scotland under the Episcopalian system, yes. which is of course the one we have now, it's yeah. bishops, archbishops, mm -hmm. yeah. etc., yeah. uh, from Presbyterianism, yeah. which um, was presbyters as sort of, yeah. who are sort of like advisory yeah, so kind of you know, yeah. scholars, essentially. And the, the main issue of the Bishop's War was, was the prayer book, yes. uh, the English Book of Common Prayer. prayer. One of the things that Lord really wanted was um, a unified um, church. Uh, he didn't want opposition. Uh, from from the country, and so he wanted everyone to follow the same prayer book, and that was met with extreme displeasure in Scotland, uh, and that's what absolutely leads to the bishops' war. But and it's also sort of opposition from. 
from the Scots. But, but the big problem with the Bishop's War, of course, is that um, wars cost quite a bit of money. Yes. And um, <laughs> right now, Charles couldn't actually raise anything mm-hmm. more, and so he resorted to quite um, kind of... Yeah. Um, because, of course, during this personal rule, Charles is not calling Parliament there, so he can't raise taxes um, or anything like that. And he's kind of been avoiding war wherever possible yeah. to make this work. Um, but at this point, he's kind of like, I need to do something. But um, he, he resorted to some quite funny um, yeah. kind of means. So he resurrected a lot of archaic finds. Yes. So uh, I have this one here, The Distraint of knight- Knighthood, um, <laughs> which said that um, any man uh, who earned over £200 a year in um, property or rent um, uh, had to attend the king's coronation um, in order to be knighted, which is some archaic you know, um, law passed hundreds of years ago and hadn't been followed up on for years upon years, uh, he <laughs> then resurrected that and then fined every nobleman who hadn't attended his coronation. <laughs> it's, yeah, um, it's, it's just petty, isn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and, but the, the point is it's nobility again. He's yes. attacking this sort of newly moneyed yeah, middle absolutely. class, yeah. which you know was the predominant force in Parliament and also one of the predominant forces um, for the Puritans. Yeah. They, they were often, you know, very much Puritan because they didn't, you know, much of the old nobility was Catholic, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, but these new um, kind of noblemen were yeah. mainly Those Protestants. Were, yeah, absolutely. And like, the, the reason sort of Charles needed like Parliament and everything like that is because these gentry, these sort of new nobility were the ones who collected the taxes. Yeah. Um, so he needed their support if he was ever going to raise any money at all. Yeah. Um, so I think all of this um, led to the convention of the Long Parliament in yeah. um, 1640. So I was like, I, I need to get Parliament back. And um, it, you might yeah. be wondering why it's called the Long Parliament. That's because it rained for, um, or it was in, in yeah. session for 20 years. Yes. <laughs> Which, um, um, yeah, obviously we do have the, the short parliaments just before the Long yeah. Parliament where he, he sort of tries to bring that Parliament, but they fall out so quickly. Yeah. They just kind of like, this is not working at all. And things start to really drastically go downhill yeah. from that point. So he, he tried to open Parliament and gave this sort of like speech, trying to be in favour of his mm-hmm. measures. Um, he kind of tried to defend his record. Yeah. So things like ship money, actually, we didn't mention ship yeah, money. No, yeah, um, so really this was in 1634, yeah. um, and it was where he essentially orchestrated a scare about a naval battle with, um, I think it's probably France at this point, so. um, uh, to. Uh, resurrect ship money, and so I have to be careful pronouncing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so that w- that was the a, f- a tax put on um, kind of usually coastal, coastal counties. Yeah, yes, that was the major thing: coastal yeah. counties um, to support the navy in times of war. Yeah. But the thing is, Charles said, "Well, actually, the entire country needs defending. So how about let's apply it to you know um, Derbyshire, <laughs> yeah, Derbyshire, and those, yeah, those coastal counties." <laughs> because <laughs> we're, we're, who, of course, you yeah. know, had never... Just by the seaside all the time. Like, yeah. they need to pay for that protection yeah. on those beaches. And so, obviously, um, Parliament was quite angry at that because that's their money that, mm-hmm. you know, they have to pay. Yeah. Um, and I think it was John Hampton yeah. was the member who was... Um, yeah, for yeah they, he goes to court to, to try and avoid paying... Yeah. Um, the shipping tax. He's comes. only very narrowly uh, defeated. And yes. So, in fact, even the judiciary really doesn't believe in this tax no, at all. Yeah, absolutely not. Um, so, the, returning to the Long Parliament, mm. it was assembled in uh, November 1640. I have a couple here. Um, it impeached William Lord um, on the <laughs> 18th oh. of on the 18th of December. Poor old Lord. Um, so, yeah, poor old Lord indeed. We named our house after him. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. Uh, he was arrested and executed five years later. Mm. And then also they impeached uh, John Finch, who was Lord Keeper of the Great Seal, which mm. is you know, a high um, rank in the nobility, uh, the day after. And he fled to, um, uh, I think it was the Netherlands. Mm. Um, and, yeah. and, but the thing is, they also impeached um, uh, kind of the Earl of Strafford early on. Yes, um, yeah. And I think possibly talk a little bit about the Earl of Strafford. Um, mm. So he was the um, Lord Deputy of Ireland, as I'd mentioned before, um, and kind of it was a peculiar situation at the time because, um, as we might know from the migration topics, uh, things like the Ulster plantations, there's also the Munster yes. plantations. Yeah. So this was the kind of bringing in of 
Protestant yeah. um, families into yeah. Ireland. And this was, once again, um, it was, you know, kind of Protestant, Puritan noblemen who were benefiting. And it was the old English nobles there who were kind of being forced aside. Um, and these men were um, kind of described as being more Irish than the Irish themselves. <laughs> so they, they, had, they were very well accustomed to kind of, Ireland. And um, so, um, you know, that was... That, yeah. that that was that caused a bit of yeah kind of absolutely anger in of itself yeah but and and Ireland will continue to sort of cause problems yes. throughout the whole of the war there's, there's sort of rumours with the with the bishops war that Charles is heading over to Ireland to raise a, yes. a Catholic yeah. army of um, of Irishmen to come and crush the Scottish yeah um, and that's kind of one of the things that sort of frustrates Parliament even more yeah um, um, so uh, yeah. so yeah, when um, Strafford was very unpopular, and so that was why he was impeached. But the thing is, every single part of the um, kind of political structure of Ireland was in favour of that. So the old <coughs> clansmen, the um, older English noblemen, um, and also the um, uh, the new Protestants were all, all opposed yeah. him yes, because absolutely. he backed England over Ireland essentially. Yeah. Which Charles does a spectacularly good job of appointing terrible people. Yeah. <laughs> um, like Lord Strafford, Buckingham, just routinely terrible at yeah. their jobs. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so after that... Um, the, we're, we're getting to the Civil War now. We're, yeah. we're, get, we're getting pretty really? close here. Really <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, after this, the Triennial Act was yes, passed. of course. In 1641, I yep. believe. Um, and this meant that Parliament had to be convened every three years. Um, but the thing is, Parliament was clever in this because they knew that Charles obviously would be like, mm, no. Uh, so they partnered it with a subsidy bill, which essentially gave Charles a bit more money to fight his various wars all over the place. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so um, he was forced to sign it, mm, yeah. or else he would get no money for the next year. And yeah, so absolutely. he was locked in by Parliament yeah. into that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of the sort of situation at this point where some parts of both sides are looking to go to war and others are trying to look to save things. It's yeah. kind of just all teetering on the edge at this point. Yeah. Until I think the uh, decisive moment mm. is when in um, 1642, yeah. um, Charles storms Parliament. Yep. I think it's the only way to describe it, really. Yep. Um, yes. <laughs> this uh, so was another he, great, great moment from Charles. Really good plan. Yeah. Um, so he just came in, um, and because he believed that there were um, uh, certain members of Parliament yeah. who were conspiring to yeah. um, get a kind of um, antagonise the Londoners yeah. against Charles. Yeah, crush the saboteurs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so he he came in and tried to arrest them. Only they weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do your research, like seriously. Um, and so obviously it was a bit of an embarrassment for him. Yeah. He asked the speaker where they were, didn't, didn't say anything. And he was like, nope. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously that, that was yeah. kind of the short. Yeah, yeah. And, and Charles is now in a situation where he sort of feels like London is against me. I, I'm no longer safe with Parliament. I'm no longer safe in, in the city of London. And he decides, all right, let's go north. Yeah. They're, they're, they're nice and friendly up there. Yeah. So he goes up Talks to, to each other. <laughs> so he goes up to uh, Nottingham mm. and raises the royal standard. Yep. Um, doesn't he? Yeah. As it, there's another sort of incident that kind of drives us. He he heads up north to Hull. Yeah. Um, and oh, yes, attempts and to sort of gather, um, I think, troops and ammunition from Hull. Uh, and the governor and the sort of the parliament appointed um, sort of city governor basically says no and doesn't <laughs> let him in. Uh, and just think about that, sort of the, the king of the country being refused access to a city like Hull. Yeah. Um, like, things things have hit a exactly. almost breaking I mean, point they do yet. things differently up there in yeah. Hull, though. I mean, they have, like, white, right. white telephone boxes and stuff. Like, <laughs> very strange place. <laughs> but the thing is, um, so, uh, uh, but, so, just kind of, obviously, you aren't going to cover all of it in no. minute yeah, detail. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah. So, I think it might be good to say here that, sort of, the mm -hmm. Parliament strongholds were generally, sort of, in the south and yep. southeast, really. Yeah. So it's like London, yeah. um, you know, and uh, kind of but cathedral the, towns. Yeah, particularly the sort of uh, urban areas were generally in favour of Parliament and the more rural areas generally in favour of, yeah. of Charles. But large areas of the country sort of tried to sort of stay out of the fighting, like 
when they sort of first call their banners, they they only got relatively small armies, sort of a few thousand men on each side. Um, in some parts of the country, you might not even necessarily know if there was a war going on. But increasingly, as it goes on, it divides families, it divides communities. It's not necessarily something where you can easily say, "All right, these guys are Protestant; these guys, sorry, or like, is it on religious lines partly, mm. but not always on religious lines; on geographical lines partly, but not always." Yeah. There's a lot of inconsistencies yeah. with who's supporting which side. And I think probably also it's sort of on kind of um, class lines as well. Yeah. You know, not to make it all about class. Yeah. Um, but you know, Let's sort get of. Marxist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but sort of in the ports, in the wealthy merchant yeah. towns, mm -hmm. they were all generally in favour of Parliament yeah. over um, yeah. over Charles, and kind of that reflected, uh, you know, what we saw in the House of Commons that this sort of new nobility, this new middle class, mm -hmm. um, is kind of dedicated to decentralised rule. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, in in keeping with the sort of ideas mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. So. Um, Oh, okay. yeah. So yeah. Let's, let's have a little, quick run through the Civil War, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I think in the first year or so, the Royalists have a bit of an upper hand. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there was a huge battle at Edge Hill, yeah. which was very big, but achieved very little. Yes, you have uh, yeah, a few thousand deaths on each side. Kind of both sides kind of meet, not really expecting to meet. Mm -hmm. And then, like, oh, the other guy's there, let's have a fight. Um, and nothing's really decided. Yeah. It kind of felt that if one side had won decisively, at Edge Hill, maybe it would have been over really quick. But as a result, the war really drags on for the next few years. Yeah. Um, and I think, so, the, the, the kind of commanders on either side, mm -hmm. so um, on the royalist side is Prince Rupert of the Rhine. Yes. Um, who's a kind of... Um, Dashing. Yeah. He's, he's, he's nephew of yeah. Charles I. I think he embodies a sort of cavalier spirit in yeah, that he was I incredibly effective in mm -hmm. his cavalry charges. Yeah. However, he had a tendency to allow his cavalry to pursue the mm -hmm. um, kind of fleeing forces yeah. after. Mm -hmm. Which uh, comes in comes in you yes, know, later, um, and yeah. then on the other side we have um, Robert Devereux, who's yes. sort of major. Um, yep, the, uh, yeah, the Earl of Essex. Yes, yeah, the third Earl of Essex. Yes, not that the, one. <laughs> this this time ready to uh, lead a successful yes. rebellion against yep. the king. Yep. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, so they sort of had the upper hand up until I would say around Newbury. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Newbury. Time. It does seem to be a key turn. So um, what happens in Newbury? So. Um, the Royalists had taken, mm -hmm. you know, been a successful campaign in yeah. the uh, south. They'd taken uh, Banbury, Oxford, and Reading. Mm -hmm. um, Shouts to Reading. Yeah. Um, but and but and so Robert Devereux's mm -hmm. army is now yeah. retreating towards London. Yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, it's in actually quite good shape, mm -hmm. you know, because compared to Charles's army, which is, you know, they've obviously just taken three towns in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a few months so but yeah. you know. Um and so, hard work that, exactly. That, yeah. Yeah. Um and so um uh, I think what what happens is uh kind of the um Devereux um yeah. kind of charges forward kind of quickly yeah. in the battle, kind yeah. of early on in the day and takes Round Hill, mm -hmm. uh, which is a strategic point on the kind of battlefield. Um and uh what that m made um what that, what that kind of resulted in was a kind of difficult advance and a difficult yeah. day's battle for uh, yeah. kind of um, Charles's uh, royalists. And so mm -hmm. um, they were forced to let um, kind of the Earl of Essex's army yeah. return to London. Yeah. And so if that hadn't happened, if, yeah. you know, they had successfully intercepted and yeah. crushed them at the time, yeah. you know, um, I think possibly it would have turned out a lot different. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, and obviously sort of things continue to kind of turn against the royalists up in the north as well. Um, right. Hang on, wait, oh, are you going yeah. to um, in? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so actually there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a kind of pivotal moment here which, which you know, turns the war in Parliament's favour without actually seeming to. So in Ed Walton Moor, uh, which is in 1643, uh, the Earl of Newcastle mm -hmm. kind of just um, wipes out Fairfax's army. So yeah. Fairfax is um, one of the big leaders of the... Uh, of the yeah. um, of the parliamentarians, yeah. Um, but the thing is, despite that kind of big defeat, and obviously you know, it was big, yeah. um, what it happened and what it resulted in was Parliament uh, seeking an agreement with the Covenanters. Yes. So um, the Covenanters was the um, kind of force left behind by the Bishops' War. Yes. So because Charles um, failed to defeat Scotland in the Bishops' War, um, there was now this kind of big army in the north, yeah. you know, yeah, in, in, in Scotland. 
Um, and that came in handy, um, with, I think, what you Yeah, I've seen what was about to bring on to you. Thanks for stopping me. Um, but the Battle, Battle of Marston Moor uh, in 1644, um, which, which sees a, a relatively sort of comprehensive defeat of the, of the sort of parliamentarian army, uh, and sort of gives the, sorry, of the Royalist army by the parliamentarians, um, giving them control of York, which is a crucial town, uh, and really the sort of control of the North together with that, as you said, that Scottish Covenant army yeah. uh, is really, really sort of vital at this point. Uh, it's also really significant for the rise of, um, obviously, a key figure in the whole of this, which is yeah. Oliver Cromwell, yes. um, who's commanding forces there, and sort of gets himself noticed yeah. as a real key figure so, in um, the in the round of army. Yeah. yeah, so at Marston Moor, so um, back then um, the kind of major general, mm -hmm. or the, the more senior yeah. general took the right wing yes. and the um, kind of lesser general took the left wing, yeah. um, but it, it was actually Cromwell's kind of mm -hmm. skillful and resolute, um, you know, offensive by the yeah. Covenant in, in the kind of um, infantry that led to <coughs> such a comprehensive victory mm -hmm. yeah. at uh, Marston Moor. Yeah. So you can see again... <laughs> you, you can see again um, <laughs> the effects of um, kind of Cromwell and yeah. the Covenanters yeah. um, in this um, victory. Yeah, absolutely. Shall we, while we introduce Cromwell, should we just give him a bit of background about yeah, bit of who, who Cromwell was? Yeah. Who is Cromwell? Cromwell? Exactly. So, so Cromwell had been sort of like a, um, come from a relatively humble origin, sort of minor member of the gentry um, in sort of around sort of Cambridge, Huntington. He's late so as MP for Huntington. Um, had been sort of involved with politics, but not necessarily super radical, yeah. um, but seems to have gone on some sort of illness or incident or something that kind of really turned his religion into sort of strict Puritanism yeah. and to increasing sort of service parliament became increasingly radical. Uh, and as we were saying, sort of uh, enlists in the army, gathers some troops together and quickly gets noticed as a very effective commander, particularly with cavalry. Uh, and he rises up through the forces and kind of his, his sort of coming out Sort of moment is at Master Moore, where mm -hmm. he really demonstrates that he is a, a commander to be reckoned with. Yeah, um, I, precisely. Um, yeah, and I think as as it as his, the victories keep rolling in, mm -hmm. he becomes more kind of vindicated in his religious beliefs. Essentially, yeah, it becomes absolutely. more radical as the yeah. um, war rolls on. So yeah. I think probably the next battle worth looking at is Naseby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think before we get to Naseby, mm -hmm. we should mention the new model arm. Oh um, yeah, and the very much closely linked to Cromwell. Um, kind of things after, with Master Moore and things, the, the Roundheads have been unable to sort of strike a final blow to finish the Royalists. And there's some sort of discontent with the, within the army about how things are going. Uh, and so they decided to put together what's called the New Model Army, um, which kind of is supposed to sort of reconstitute the army on more sort of religious lines and sort of stricter discipline and things like that. Um, they also pass um, the self-denying ordinance um, which takes, um, which means all members of parliament have to resign their military commissions, um, with the exception of Cromwell, obviously. <laughs> um, and to, to try and, and this sort of marks the first kind of real division between the army and parliament. You see the army becoming powerful in its own rights, slightly separate from parliament. Mm. Um, and yeah, but that brings up the, onto Naseby, as you were yeah. saying. So, um, Kind of it in Naseby, kind of to set the scene, mm -hmm. you know, it had been pretty torrid for the Royalists yeah. kind of before then. Yeah. You know, they'd been they'd been kind of losing a bit. Mm -hmm. Um so it comes to the battle. Um so Prince Rupert of the Rhine, you know, has a big cavalry charge yeah. against um as, as he is wont to do. Yeah, yeah. Um against uh, General Ireton um and routes the infantry. Um and you know, obviously great thing, but the thing is he lets his cavalry go off and pursue them. Um, which obviously is the cavalier thing to do, but not the uh, kind of tactic, tactical thing to do. Um, and so that kind of meant that there's no cavalry on the, on, on the, on the right side. Um, Slightly problematic. It's, it is, isn't it? Um, uh, and kind of um, what happens after that is that um, Cromwell uh, routes the centre, which obviously mm. is infantry at this time, yeah. um, and then kind of... You know, he, he essentially yeah. just destroys the centre yeah. of the of the army. Absolutely, and, and the they're, they're kind of done. Yeah. Army, yeah, I mean, yeah, no, not much point to too much. Yeah, so, um, yeah. It was, yeah. So after the siege of Oxford, 
<coughs> yeah. uh, a year later, you know, which was the very end. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Kind of Charles um, escaped dressed as a servant. Yeah. Um, I think so. yeah, yeah. Um, and then kind of went up and placed himself in the trust of a Scottish army. Yeah. Um, and who eventually handed him over to yeah. Parliament. So yeah. Um, so I think actually at that point, um, mm-hmm. obviously kind of people look at the overview and think, yes. okay, 1647, he's captured, and then yes. 1649, he's yes. executed. Yeah. Um, you know, they think that it's just kind of open and shut. <coughs> yeah. But it's, kind of, not. it's a lot yeah. more kind of complicated mm-hmm. than that. Yeah. And I think this kind of brings us on to the rump parliament. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think a key thing to remember at this point is that um, no, that at this point of the Civil War, very, very few people are, are imagining a situation without a king. Mm. Everyone is still expecting Charles to be king, just come to sort of some sort of agreement to increase the power of Parliament, uh, remedy some of the sort of problems that they've seen in Charles' reign. Uh, there's no ex- expectation of the execution of the king or anything like that at this point. Um, that- yeah. And that's sort of a thing, isn't it? Because, mm. you know, they try to negotiate with Charles, try to establish a constitutional monarchy. Mm. Charles disagrees. Charles yes. completely refuses. Yes. Because, obviously, that's how he's been brought up. Yeah, he yeah. believed in the divine right of kings, and so he didn't want to be limited by what he viewed to be an illegitimate power. <laughs> yeah. um, just so, but yeah. the thing is, at the same time, most of the long parliament was still in favour of giving... Um, Charles essentially backed the monarchy. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. And so this, this leads to the rump parliament. Yeah. Well, 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 purge. Yeah, well, yeah, I think it'd be sort of good to mention that sort of Charles at this time is kind of playing off the different factions against each other. So you've got the army, you've got the parliament, you've got the Scots there as well. And Ooh. Charles is kind of negotiating yeah, with all of actually, these different groups. Yeah. Um, yeah and, and kind of trying to get them involved. And mm-hmm. it would sort of briefly mentioned it, the Second Civil War kind of breaks out right. and he kind of gets the Scots to go up in rebellion in yeah. support of him. Um, it's all relatively quickly crushed um, by Cromwell, yeah. relatively brutal, um, and Fairfax in relatively brutal fashion. Yeah. And um, the, the thing is, that was kind of Cromwell's first time that he was in com- complete control of the army. Yeah. And so it essentially completes his kind of... Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. rise to power. Yeah, he's still sort of there with, with Fairfax commanding, but yeah, absolutely. And um, so I think after after that, mm-hmm. um, uh, so Thomas Pride, yes. who is a general in the New Model Army, yeah, absolutely. Um, arrested arrests mm-hmm. and bars, yeah. um, you know, from entering Parliament. Mm-hmm. Basically, all of the members who they know to be um, yeah. supportive of Charles, yeah. um, and you know, the remaining members um, vote through yeah. um, Charles's execution. Yeah, and this, this is. I think him. this is. Basically a military coup, yeah. um, that's the way to put it. The yeah. army has decided, especially after Charles has kind of rebelled for a second time, or at least incited rebellion, that they cannot countenance Charles remaining as king. Yeah. Um, so this is opposing par- Parliament who are seeing the, ki- the monarchy continuing, mm-hmm. and this is effectively a military coup um, to force through this decision of execution of the king. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that it happens, um, yeah. um, and one of the big controversies. Oh, yeah, yeah, but one of the big controversies was about the um, who would sign his death warrant. Yes, you know. Um, so obviously Cromwell consented because he, I think, didn't actually believe that it was regicide. Mm. You know, it was one of his big ideas. You yeah. know, from the Bible or whatever. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, but Thomas Fairfax, who was mm. one of the major. Uh, players yeah. in the parliamentarian yeah, absolutely. had led the parliamentarian army since 1645 um, yeah. didn't sign it yeah um, Fairfax very much a moderate didn't want to see an end to the monarchy at this point uh, again it's a very much a radical opinion to get rid of the monarchy yeah. this is not widespread at all at this point yeah um, so I think this kind of brings us on to Cromwell as yeah. protector yeah absolutely um, so yeah we've got a situation we have no king anymore what what do we do? Well, uh, um, I think Cromwell sort of knows what to do. Yes. Um, cr- yeah. Crush the pesky Irish. Yes. So, as we mentioned before, um, the um, mood in Ireland was that of discontent, that of rebellion. Yep. Um, there was a rebellion, I think, in 1642, yep, which, you know, as you know, led to the mm. um, Civil War in the first place. Yeah. Um, and so he went off and... Um, confiscated the old English nobles' land yeah. um, and sent them to inferior yeah. um, 
holdings in Connacht, yeah. um, and took Drogheda and Wexford, yeah. killing uh, 5,000 yes. civilians yeah. in the process. Yeah, Cromwell's crushing of Ireland is horribly brutal. Yeah. It really kind of cements his legacy as like one of the real sort of black marks on his legacy. And, and, and then, then yeah, and then sort of obviously Cromwell in England tries to sort of rule with Parliament for a while, um, but seems increasingly just sort of fed up with Parliament. Yeah. Um, you have the the, the the rump that remains, known as the rump that remains after Pride's purge. Um, you're trying to get things done, but Cromwell is increasingly like, guys, like seriously, just do a better job. Um, and yeah. he goes in and dissolves Parliament yeah. um, and puts it together what's called the bare bones parliament because it is the bare bones <laughs> it's not no longer elected appointed by Cromwell just as kind of like a bit of a so, sheen of legitimacy for his reign yeah, so, so I think that's probably the great irony of the civil war is that yeah. it was a kind of an uprising by the mm-hmm. middle class nobility you yeah. know in support of their own legislative power mm-hmm. and kind of say in the country yeah. and in the end they were all kind of chucked out of that process. Yes, um, absolutely. And one, one tyrant replaced with another, as some, some might say. Yeah, and um, so he, he, he introduced kind of authoritarian and milit- militar- mm. militaristic policies, yep. so he absolutely. divided England into portions led by major generals, mm. um, which kind of is a sign of the increasing militarisation of, of England, um, and also um, uh, had censors for um, unsuitable uh, clergymen, yeah. you know, which is a bit ironic given um, mm. you know, his opposition to <laughs> Archbishop Lord before, yeah. <laughs> who did the exact same thing essentially. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think probably one of the last major things within Cromwell's reign himself yeah. was when he was offered the crown. Yeah, absolutely. We could have had King Oliver the first, yeah. um, the, the Cromwellian dynasty. Um, but yeah, I, Cromwell, for all his sort of military dictatorship, he does seem to be principled man yes um, and I think he sort of ums and ahs about it for a while about should I accept the crown um, and eventually decides to, to decline the crown although um, as you say he is sort of re not crowned but obviously re sort of um, what's the word reappointed reappointed as, as lord protector of England yeah um, but just not without the yeah, in a big old ceremony in Westminster yeah. Hall, with him yeah. sitting in um, Saint King Edward's chair, yeah. um, holding a big old scepter. But he's not king, okay? He's not king. Yeah. He's, <laughs> not, he's, he's not. Yeah, um, So um, when Ollie died, the people yeah. said, "Charlie, me hearty, get yeah. rid of his dull rules." They said, "We'd rather party." Yeah. Um, <laughs> and this action was known as the Monarchy Restoration, which yes. I don't think it was actually followed by a great celebration, but let's talk about that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I think we should give Richard Cromwell a brief, brief, yeah. brief mention. So it's not really worth much of one, but yeah. So after our guy Ollie died, yeah. um, his son Richard yeah. Cromwell um, became Lord Protector, and he just doesn't really want to do the job. Yeah. Is the impression I get. He doesn't particularly. He's not. He's not the the man his father is in terms of rulership and sort of fervent um, sort of belief as well. And he resigns after eight months. And I think a sort of yeah. parallel you can see in fiction would be um, the mayor's son in Horton Hears a Who, who is um, utterly uh, unwilling to follow his father's uh, footsteps. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to check that one out. Um, so, yeah, um, so he, he resigns in what, 1659, doesn't yeah, he? Absolutely. And um, Charles is proclaimed king, Charles II, this being. 1660. Yeah. Um, and. Um, you know, although it seems that nothing's changed and that there's, you know, the Stuart dynasty continues, yeah. it, it doesn't continue very long after. No. So af- after Charles II dies, James I, James II Second comes again. in, sorry. Yeah. Um, and he is himself deposed, yes. um, again at the invitation of Parliament, yeah. um, by William III of Orange. Yes, in the Glorious Revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think once again showing the kind of shift away from... Yeah. Um, absolute monarchy of the yeah, Stuarts absolutely. towards a sort of constitutional monarchy mm-hmm. that we know today yeah, and um, uh, obviously the significant action in uh, the Glorious Revolution mm-hmm. aside from the Battle of Reading which Charles is Reading, you know, yeah. huge yeah. Um, uh, is the um, British Bill of Rights yes absolutely 1689 yes, which means that Parliament can um, 
or the king in parliament. So it's technically um, yeah. the sovereign with their reserve powers, but its parliament, yes, at this, by absolutely. this point, yeah. um, can um, overrule or overwrite any law in you know the land. Mm-hmm. So you know, as opposed to the kind of American yeah. constitution, yeah. you know, <laughs> if parliament decided to do whatever, they yeah. can. Yeah, sovereignty has is, is been put much more in the hands of parliament than of, of the monarch. Yeah. I mean, not to, sorry to that degree, but it's, it is very much a key step coming for soon after the Civil War, moving towards parliamentary constitutional democracy. Yeah, so I think what would be, well, it's kind of difficult to know mm-hmm. what to make of the English Civil War. Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of that thing, is it kind of just a, a brief sort of like, bit of a, a misnomer, something, a sort of step back in a way, or is it a sign of the radical future, or is it just a, a military dictatorship? That is a, is it, it can be a difficult one to sort of pin down. Um, but I think it's really sort of significant in, in strengthening the power of parliament, uh, in um, showing the sort of belief uh, in some idea of democracy yeah. in some ways in England yeah. for a lot of people. So, so like, like actually, we forgot to touch on the levellers, yeah. so let, yeah. let's do that now. They yeah. were a faction, political faction, mm-hmm. within the middle class, yeah. which called for um, universal suffrage, yes. which it actually has a very loose definition, yeah. um, which is essentially um, called for a vote for any adult man who um, is not in debt to anyone, nor does not, nor could he rent land? Rent, yeah. So rent um, my student debt uh, is, is putting me in problems there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because they essentially believed that a um, woman is dependent on the man, you know, because obviously, you know, yeah. if the woman died, the man would be just fine. Um, <laughs> um, and then also... Um, yeah, and, and then also um, that debt puts mm. people in yeah. a bad situation yeah. and that obviously renting land means that you're subservient to your landlord so yeah. it just so happened that propertyed men yeah. are the only people who can uh, who can vote so yeah. once again well, showing that yeah. <laughs> showing that social yeah. progress um, <laughs> was driven by those who were propertyed at the time and that yeah. was obviously um, kind of this new middle class yeah. and if you look sort of beyond into the 1700s mm-hmm. you can see this definitive shift towards the middle class essentially yeah, so cool. you, you have like um, Robert Walpole, yep, who was you know, a, a commoner um, prime minister, essentially. Yeah, yeah. You know, all, all the rest, you know, quite a few of the rest in that era were um, um, kind of part of this gentry class yeah. and kind of this defined this for sure. But yeah, so yeah, wonderful. I think yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Um, any any questions? From the uh, from the audience. Um, so you talked about the battles. So um, at this time, what what was kind of like um, the composition of the army? Let's oh, say. So what were the army actually like? question. Um, I did a bit of research on this. So um, wh- how it was set out was there was cavalry on either flank, and there was a kind of a row of pikemen in the middle, yeah. essentially. Um, so we're sort of getting to that stage where it's kind of that strange mix between pikemen and yeah. riflemen. Yeah. So there was this thing called the pike and shot, yes. which was that um, riflemen stood between pikemen. So the riflemen obviously would get their you know, shot away, and then the pikemen would defend from cavalry charges. Um, and um, Prince Rupert of the Rhine um, kind of revolutionised the cavalry charges in that he proposed that you know, they fired their pistols as they you know, kind of came upon the uh, infantry. Yeah. Um, so... Um, it was at that strange time where pistols and yeah. uh, firearms it's, it's, were... It's the beginning of sort of combined arms. To yeah. like this is around the time of the reforms of Gustavus Adolphus, um, the great Swedish uh, emperor who kind of revolutionises warfare with his, his reforms and things like that. Um, so, but yeah, there's mixed formations of, of pikes, of, um, of muskets and, and with cavalry and smaller field guns as well being introduced so it's kind of a transformative time and that sort of the discipline of the new model army really helps them to be effective yeah actually that's definitely one we should do the northern war that's yeah, that's, that's, that's a start yeah, yeah. um 
and obviously I talked before about um, general being on either flank. Um, this kind of shows again, um, you know, despite kind of this new technology, uh, that communication was yeah. kind of crucial. not yeah. really yeah. was both crucial and not particularly one that was around at the time. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, they didn't have kind of go and do different things. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, they essentially just had free reign over the cavalry mm. and infantry and on that flank, and yeah. there was no central commander, yeah. and so it was, it wasn't quite the sort of medieval kind of jewels essentially where, no. um, you know, battles were completely and utterly um, kind of uncoordinated, yeah. but it was again a transition towards, um, yeah. you know, generals playing yeah. a big role towards yeah, the sort of yeah. yeah. Wonderful. That's the first thing.